Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this Carsonwa track. Uh, to, this will be the first talk of uh, five talks that you will have today about Carsonwa. So if you're interested about the topic, you will definitely have uh, some very great uh, coverage on this uh, distributed database today. And uh, uh, if you were already somewhat familiar with it, you will probably and hopefully discover quite a bunch of new features and new stuff that have been uh, developed over the past year uh, within this project. It's a very fast-moving project. Uh, it, and uh, hopefully you will uh, realize that it's now ready for, for the mainstream market. It's ready to be used in a bunch and a wide range of enterprise application. So uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, because we've got quite a huge agenda today. Uh, so this talk will actually introduce you a bit of uh, uh, the Casanova concept. Uh, you, I will give you a very quick introduction to Casanova. Uh, so if, even if you're not familiar with it, you hopefully you will uh, be able to, uh, to understand everything. And then I will move forward very quickly to uh, uh, what's new in, ca in the Carson world and especially uh, what we've done recently to uh, improve the user experience, the developer experience with Carson and to make it, uh, to bring this awesome piece of architecture uh, to the mass with uh, some uh, very uh, simple and efficient uh, APIs and interface. Uh, so just a quick word about myself. Uh, my name is Michael Figuier. I'm French, which probably explains the kind of accent that you will hear for the next 60 minutes or so. Uh, so if you're interested in what I'm talking about, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. And let's move forward immediately with uh, uh, the quick introduction of Cassandra that I've mentioned. So Cassandra, uh, is an Apache project. It's available, it's uh, fully open source, like probably everything you will see today. <laughs> and uh, it's available on uh, castanova.apache.org. So it's a distributed database. Uh, there's a bunch of distributed database uh, in the very fast growing NoSQL world. So the particularity of this one is that all the nodes uh, in its architecture have exactly the same role. Uh, they simply don't carry this, uh, all the same data, but every node is similar. It's a peer-to-peer -peer distributed database. There's no master, there's no slave, uh, there's no primary or secondary or anything like that. So the idea is that uh, all your nodes will be organized uh, in, uh, in such a uh, in such a wing architecture. Uh, why a wing? It's simply because all the data uh, uh, that you want to store in this di distributed storage will be spread over, over all this node using some kind of partitioning scheme. And uh, we organize all that in a wing in order to have a continuous uh, key space. So within uh, this distributed uh, that storage, you will have several replicas for all your data. That is, uh, your data is partitioned. You've got several part, uh, you've got a bunch of partition, and each partition is replicated uh, over uh, a bunch of replica. You can configure it by default, it's just three. And the very interesting thing in this architecture is that uh, it actually, it's actually linearly scalable. So that's something you will probably hear a lot uh, uh, in the NoSQL space. You know, that's actually uh, the, the ultimate goal whenever you try to uh, build some uh, distributed database, some, uh, uh, some database that uh, are able to scale out, you know. So, Probably one of the huge different difference uh, for Casanova in the case of Casanova is that when we talk about uh, linear scalability, uh, we actually achieve it. Uh, this is uh, a benchmark that has been done by Netflix. Netflix is, uh, I think, uh, to date our biggest user. 
they, are, they have uh, several hundreds of Cassandra nodes in production. And um, so in this graph, you can see some experiments that Netflix did on uh, Amazon EC2. So they've uh, simply uh, uh, added uh, more and more nodes and they've just tried to, uh, to see how much white they were able to perform on, uh, on, uh, on this cluster. And uh, you can see that uh, they've, uh, they've measured it at 50, 150, and up to 300 nodes. Uh, and at 300 nodes, they were actually able to perform uh, 1 million white per second. Uh, with a replication factor of three, that is, uh, all this piece of data were actually uh, written uh, three million times uh, at all because you've got three replicas for each of them. So uh, I think that the, that's a very important feature. Uh, if you're familiar with Hadoop, for instance, you know that in the Hadoop world, uh, the, piece, uh, the piece of code, the piece of uh, uh, of processing that you're writing for your uh, uh, to 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 work on top of Hadoop uh, is supposed to be the same at whatever the scale. You know, if, if you start to write some logic for a three uh, node cluster, it will uh, most you can uh, mostly run it uh, in similar condition on a 100 node cluster. Uh, well. Uh, with very few modification, and that basically will be the same with Casanova. Whenever you design some data model for a small cluster, you will be able to scale it to a much larger cluster. So that's some very interesting features in this fast-moving world where your user base can grow very quickly. So I've mentioned that it was a distributed database, but uh, a very interesting thing is that now let's uh, imagine uh, that I'm the client and I want to retrieve some of this data. Uh, uh, all these data are, are replicated on, uh, on several nodes, as I mentioned, but uh, not, uh, I still need to find where my data will actually be, will actually be stored. Uh, and which replica actually hold, uh, which node actually holds some replica for the data I'm looking for. So, um, what actually happened is that in Casanova, a client can connect, can contact any node uh, of the cluster. Uh, it's perfectly fine because all the nodes, once again, have exactly the same role. So, Whenever a client will connect to a node in Casanova, uh, this node will, uh, will act as a coordinate to a node in the context of this request, and will just forward uh, the read or write request it has received to uh, all the replicas uh, for the given uh, data, a piece of data that we are considering. And it's, this node will actually be able to do so because in Casanova, uh, we maintain on every node, uh, the actual uh, index for all the range, uh, for the location of each range of keys. So each node will be aware of uh, the current location of uh, any piece of data. And, and it will be able to, uh, to perform this uh, forwarding of any piece of, uh, uh, of request. So what's, interest, what's very interesting next is that you're probably used to, uh, to MySQL uh, or to any other kind of uh, uh, relational database. And a very classical way to perform some uh, height availability or to, uh, to perform some scalability on, in the relational world is to use some uh, replication, you know, uh, and uh, most likely using some kind of master-slave replication. So typically, uh, you're writing everything on the master, and uh, then all your data will, will be replicated on some slaves database, and uh, you will be able to send all your read requests to this slave uh, database. So in such a situation, you, you've got two choices. You can either perform some asynchronous or asynchronous replication. In the synchronous replication, everything will be consistent, that is, when your uh, master server will acknowledge your write. 
you will have some guarantee that your data is actually available on every slave. So uh, you know that everything is consistent, but then you won't be much available because if any of this slave is not available, you won't be able to complete your white request. So the more slaves you've got, uh, the less availability you will have for your cluster, which is not great. Uh, another option is to perform some asynchronous replication. But if you do so, uh, you will be fully available, actually, because if any of your slave is not available when you write something on your master, you will be able to complete everything. But uh, if uh, you won't have any guarantee of consistency, any consistency guarantee on the actual data that your slave will hold, because you didn't uh, wait for uh, the acknowledge from these slaves. So that's quite of an issue because uh, what you want is actually to have uh, kind of both of these prop property properties. So uh, in Cas Noir, there's no asynchronous or asynchronous replication like that. Instead, we use a very particular uh, replication scheme uh, that I will present right now. So um, because it's a bit... Uh, uh, particular to explain. It's a bit more complex than ours, uh, these two basic replication scheme I've just mentioned. I will just try to take an example. So imagine that you've got three replica of a given data. Let's imagine that uh, the column that we are considering right now just holds some A as value A on uh, the three of these replicas. Now let's imagine that we want to write value B. And uh, let's imagine, once again, that uh, we've configured everything to wait for only one acknowledge uh, for this write. You know, we wait for only one node to acknowledge this write. Uh, so here again, if you, uh, if you recall the, uh, my previous diagram, all that happened on the coordinator node, that is the node that uh, forward everything to the replicas. Um, so in this situation, what happens if now I want to perform a read request? If I want to perform a read request, uh, let's say that once again I will wait uh, for only one of my replica to answer uh, because I, I want to be very, uh, very, either very fast or uh, IT available. So let's do that. In this diagram, uh, I I show you actually the worst possible example. Uh, that is, uh, I just show you the kind of guarantees that you've got. Be because I just waited for, um, for single acknowledge, I d I've got no guarantee that my data is actually available on the other replicas. And the same goes for, uh, for the read because I just uh, wait for a single answer. Uh, in this example, uh, which is the worst possible case, I won't actually be able to see my last up-to-date value, which was B. And in this situation, uh, an application that writes value B and that try to read it just after it won't see something consistent because it will write B and will read A right after that. So obviously that's probably not what you want. That might be. Uh, actually, because it might be still acceptable for some use cases, maybe some weightings on, on some blog post or some comments maybe or something like that. But for a lot of use cases, you actually want this kind, to achieve this kind of consistency. So now let's imagine we increase the amount of acknowledge I was willing to wait for uh, at right time. Uh, let's imagine that I'm willing now to wait for two acknowledge at right time. Uh, well, if I still wait for only one answer at wait time, you can see that I still won't be available, uh, I still won't be consistent. Once again, I talk about the worst case here. So you probably uh, see where I want to go. If at right time I wait for two, uh, for two acknowledge at wait time, I'm willing to wait for two answers uh, from uh, from two replicas, 
I will actually be consistent in this situation because the coordinator node, the one that coordinates the whole request and forward everything to replicas, will actually be able to, uh, to see, uh, we, we are guaranteed that it will uh, be able to receive uh, the last up-to-date version of my data. And then it will actually be able to uh, figure out which is the right version because in Casanova, uh, a timestamp is attached to any piece of data. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this situation, the coordinator node will actually be able to reply to the client with uh, the correct value, which is B, after figuring it out from uh, some timestamp comparison. So in, in the Casanova world, we formalize all this uh, logic uh, with a value that we call COM, uh, because actually in order to, to be consistent, you just need uh, to have half of the replicas plus one to answer, uh, to, uh, to acknowledge or to answer your queries. And uh, uh, so that's what we call a COM. What's very interesting here is that in this situation, you can, uh, you can uh, realize that in the end, I will be consistent, and I will also be able to handle any loss of any nodes, of any replicas, um, doing uh, this whole process, either doing at, at read time or at write time. If any of uh, these replicas was not available, at least just one, uh, if I lose two replicas, I won't be able to complete everything, but if I lose just one replica, uh, I will be able to complete this whole read and write cycle without any issue. Uh, so that's what we, that's why we, we say that actually Casanova is very highly available and uh, actually in practice it's really the case. Uh, we've got, uh, at Dastax, we've got, we had a customer that came to us and said uh, that it took him more than 24 hours to realize that one of its customer node was, uh, was broken uh, because everything was still working fine. So obviously it's not because Casanova is super robust and highly available that you're not supposed to monitor your database nodes. <laughs> uh, but still, uh, that's something uh, that is very uh, interesting in production because uh, you actually don't want, that's exactly what you want for your production environment, you know, uh, when whenever a node fail at 3 a.m. in the morning, you don't want to have to rush uh, to the data center or to uh, to to your uh, ops team in order to uh, to to uh, uh, resolve everything. You know, you just want uh, to come back the next morning and to solve this situation and to have everything still working perfectly. So just to summarize what I've presented here, uh, here is the request path for, uh, for a typical request, either read or write. So the client send uh, a request to a node, any node, it can be whatever we want, whichever we want. So uh, this request will be forwarded to uh, the replicas. Depending on the consistency level we've asked for, for this request, uh, the node will ask, will wait for uh, one or more of, uh, of the replicas to answer. Uh, it will then try to, uh, uh, to figure out uh, the response for, for this request, if it was a weed request, or if it was a white request, it will just send it back to the client, uh, send back an acknowledge. Um, is there any question at this time about what I've presented? Anyway, you can uh, feel free to come to me after this talk to ask any question. <coughs> so with that. Um, another very interesting feature in Casanova is that we actually support multi data center. So because of the very interesting uh, replication scheme that I've presented to you uh, just before, um, we can leverage it to build some very efficient multi data center environment. And Casanova is uh, designed to be aware of uh, your actual uh, infrastructure topology. 
So if some of your nodes are located in different data center, uh, you just configure Cassandra to be aware of this fact, and um, Cassandra will be smart enough to ensure that you've got one replica in every data center, and uh, it will also be smart enough to uh, route every request accord according to the actual topology of your cluster. And for instance, uh, uh, it will also uh, be smart enough to uh, perform some replication with some data center awareness. That is, uh, if uh, you've just written something on, uh, on the node one, and uh, you've got two other replicas in data center B, and uh, customer will actually send only one uh, uh, one piece of data to uh, to the node three, and will just delegate uh, the responsibility to replicate on node four uh, to this node in order to avoid extra bandwidth consumption. You know. So, um, interestingly, and I won't have time to talk about it, but uh, using this kind of features, you're, uh, you're also actually able to, uh, to set up some kind of workload separation, because um, you, can, uh, you can feel free to create some kind of virtual data center that is just some data center as uh, uh, maybe all located in a single data center, physically, actually. But uh, you will be able to perform some, work, some workload separation, because in this case, uh, you can configure Cassandra to not wait for uh, uh, answers for replicas that are located in some other data center. So uh, if, for instance, you use uh, data center B to uh, perform some analytics and you've got all your production workload on data center A, you will be able to, uh, uh, to ensure no impact on, uh, on data center A, everything on your production real-time production load will perform smoothly while you are actually performing some uh, very EV analytics on some other data center. So because of the replication scheme, everything will work smoothly and you will be able to perform some analytics in production without any needs for some ETL or any other uh, typical uh, replication. So once again, I don't have time to I uh, mentioned that much, but if you're interested, feel free to talk about me uh, later about this. Um, so the question is, uh, what's the upper, upper bound uh, for latency between data centers? Uh, it will depend of, of, of obviously um, where your data centers are located. If you've got like one data center, on East Coast and one other in Australia, then the latency might actually be pretty huge. Uh, but once again, because of the replication scheme in Casanova, you won't have to wait uh, for uh, any node in the far away data center to answer uh, before giving back uh, some kind of acknowledge to your uh, client. Um, so uh, the question uh, the question is uh, what is some kind of recognized uh, limit of uh, acceptable latency? Um, well, probably you will uh, have some issue if uh, your latency start to be in the several seconds, you know, because uh, it it will be. But still, uh, customer can still work with that. It's just that you will um, uh, you basically don't want to wait at, at, uh, at read or write time for any of your far away uh, replicas to answer, especially if uh, your latency is so huge. Um, but once again, Casson will allow you to do that, so um, yeah. So now let's talk a bit about the data model. Uh, if you've read a bit about Casson, or uh, if you, uh, uh, you've actually gave it a try just a few years ago, uh, that's the model in Casanova. So it's a bit particular, it's very different from what you could 
uh, be used to in the relational world. So in this DAR model, uh, everything is actually uh, stored in some common families. And uh, for any given walkie, uh, the walkie will be used to partition all your data over your cluster. For any given walkie, uh, you will have a sorted list of key value pairs uh, sorted by key. So it's a very low level data model, actually, um, because it's uh, uh, when we say that it's sorted by key, uh, it's simply because it's all written on the disk like that. Uh, so everything will be aligned this way on the disk. Uh, so you will be able to read uh, a continuous set of uh, keys, uh, of key value pairs uh, in a single sequential read on the disk. So that's definitely a very low level mo model, which is why it's uh, I admit a bit complex to design with it. It can also be very powerful because you won't uh, need to uh, figure out uh, for hours what will actually happen on your disk and how your IOs will look like with Casanova. Uh, you will just be able to, uh, to understand how it will be simply by looking at the DAR model. Um, so with this kind of uh, DAR model, you're actually able to design some very classical uh, table-oriented uh, uh, schemas, you know, uh, with uh, some static set of columns. But you're also able to, uh, uh, to store some more interesting stuff, such as some, um, uh, you're able to use it as, uh, as some, uh, some kind of index. That is, here in this example, we are trying to store for a given user, uh, username uh, the, a list of, uh, of friends sorted by username actually, so that uh, because maybe our use case will uh, require us to, to display them in, in such an order. So we will be able to read a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, username sorted by uh, username actually, and uh, we will be able to paginate over uh, a bunch of uh, users this way and still within a single disk seek. So that's very interesting. Um, so once again, the reason, and I won't have time to, uh, to talk much about it, but the reason uh, for that is that because everything uh, in this data model is actually stored exactly this way on the disk. Uh, so actually, whenever you write something, everything is written in Casanova in, uh, in hash table in memory, and uh, uh, you've got uh, uh, and we also happen uh, this entry on the commit log, which is fairly classical in the database world. And then whenever this uh, mem table, this hash table in memory is full, we just flush everything in a sorted string table on the disk. Uh, so everything is uh, just uh, stored in a, a fairly uh, sequential manner on the disk. And whenever uh, this uh, SS table is getting uh, full, uh, whenever uh, uh, we start to have a bunch of S stable, we just uh, start to compact uh, them all together in order to uh, lead to a fewer amount of S stable, etc. This is a very huge topic. I won't have much time to talk about it, but uh, my point here was just that the actual data model of uh, Casanova is tightly coupled with uh, the way it's actually stored on the disk. Uh, so once again, very convenient for developers in order to have some real feeling about how uh, their data model will behave on the disk. So this is very interesting, but it turns out that uh, with the experience that developers had a lot of difficulties uh, to, uh, to uh, feel comfortable with this data model to learn this data model and the learning curve, to be honest, uh, was not very satisfying. So in the Casanova community, we came out with a brand new uh, data model that come as an abstraction on top of it. And uh, this data model has been finalized in the last version of Casanova, which is 1.2. And it actually looked like this. So 
Uh, it comes with uh, the last version of our query language. Uh, together, uh, so in this, uh, in this version, we, will, we release a brand new query language that actually you will see looks just like SQL and some of the similar name. And it comes with uh, a very uh, simpler uh, DA model that comes just an, as an abstraction on top of what I've presented to you earlier. So in this DA model, everything is just a bunch of uh, static, statically defined table, just like you are used to manipulate in the rational world, just a bunch of tables. A few differences. Uh, there's no join, which makes sense. We are in a distributed world. Uh, so there's no join. Uh, there's no aggregation. Uh, there's uh, and, uh, the actual amount of, uh, uh, of uh, kind of requests that you're able to perform is much more limited. So. Uh, typically, your work clauses will be much simpler. So, in practice, it will look like this. So, let's say I want to store some, uh, I want to store some uh, tweets. I want to store a timeline for uh, for some users. So, here, actually, I will, uh, I will. Uh, what will actually have been stored in a bunch of columns in the previous data model uh, will, in this situation, be uh, broken up in several rows uh, in SQL 3. And uh, what used to be a row key, in this example, uh, become a partition key. And don't worry, I will just uh, show you in the next slide uh, how it's actually uh, connected with uh, the underlying data model. Um, and then we use what we call a clustering key uh, to uh, perform all the aggregation on a single node. So all this table is declared just like this. Uh, so it's just like in SQL, you declare it with create table timeline. Uh, you declare all your uh, columns. And then you declare a primary key, the first uh, field in this primary key will become the partition key, uh, that is, uh, which will impact the way all your data will be spread over the cluster. And uh, then the following the remaining keys in this primary keys uh, will uh, tell Casanova how to aggregate the data all together on the disk. Uh, and uh, because obviously all this data could be uh, aggregated by uh, tweet ID, by author, by auto or by body on the disk. And here you're just telling customers that you want all of them to be aggregated by tweet ID. So to recall uh, the DAI models that I've presented before, uh, which was uh, made of uh, some uh, wide rows, you know, so uh, as we can remember, we had some row keys. And for each of these row keys, we had a, a sorted list of key value pairs with no limits. You know, we could have millions of them just because we were able to store some one to many relationship uh, directly on a single row. So as you can see here, um, what used to be on a single line is now broken up on several uh, rows, just like, you, uh, just like uh, you're used to do in the relational world, whenever you design some denormalized table on when, or whenever you, uh, you manipulate some result set of a joint query, that's what, that's what actually you end up with. So uh, if you remember, I said that in Casanova there's no join in this data model. So how do you pair from join? Uh, actually, in Casanova, what you do whenever you want to perform some join is that you perform all these join at write time. So that is, you will write uh, your data several times. You will duplicate them. Uh, so of course, it might not fit to any kind of use case. But uh, if you take a moment to think about it, you will actually realize that most of the use case can, uh, can cope with this situation. 
And what's really interesting is that uh, because you perform all your join at write time by just writing uh, directly to, uh, to, to some tables that are actually some kind of views in, in the good old world we used to, uh, you will be able to uh, be highly efficient at read time in production because you won't have to, to do all these kind of joins that were killing your performance and your scalability uh, in your production system. Any question? If, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, what happens if uh, you want to uh, to add another uh, column and make it part of uh, of the index? Uh, actually, uh, to to do so, you will. Uh, right now, it's not possible to do it. Uh, I think, and uh, you will actually need to uh, to um, uh, create another table for that because, uh, yeah. Uh, if you ask, ask this question, is because you could feel that it uh, it will Im actually impact quite a bit uh, the actual uh, the actual storage on the disk, and it actually impacts quite a bit the storage on the disk. That's why uh, you can do it uh, directly. Okay. Uh, just like you, uh, you're actually uh, not able to change the name of uh, of a column. Uh, you're only able to change. The name of uh, of uh, the primary uh, the column part of the primary keys, which actually makes sense because you don't see them stored uh, stored on the disk in the actual physical data layout. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so that was for the data model. So we've updated it to to make it way simpler, uh, but still we had some issue. On the, on the driver side, uh, traditionally, Gaston has relied on Apache Swift, which is an RPC framework, uh, to perform all its communication between the clients and the, and the nodes. But it was an issue because uh, it was great at first because it allowed you, it, it has given us uh, some client for every language for free because uh, Apache Swift uh, gave us a bunch of uh, of integration with any language, um, but in the, on the long term, it was it be quickly became an issue because Swift uh, is an RPC framework, so you can only perform some requests and response, which quickly become limiting for a database. Uh, moreover, uh, all all the clients were made of some generated code because that's the way Swift actually works, which turns out to be. Uh, quite of a nightmare to maintain on the client side because you had to to uh, uh, add some extra uh, API uh, uh, abstraction on top of that uh, in order to 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 uh, have some satisfying API and highly productive API. So in Carson one, the two we've introduced a new protocol that has been designed especially for Carson uh, and that is able to perform much more than simply some request response. Uh, we are able to do some request pipelining. We are able to do some notification from, uh, for some technical purpose from uh, Carson node to client uh, in order to, uh, to uh, let them know whenever uh, some node has have been added or removed. Uh, so any kind of uh, of API can be built on top of that. Uh, that will just come in the upcoming months. So at dark stacks, because the Apache project by itself doesn't actually take care of, uh, of the driver, we have built uh, a Java driver uh, using this kind of architecture. So uh, it's fully asynchronous, it's based on Netty. Uh, we bring you some prepper statement because it's a text-based query language. Um, We've got some automatic failovers. That is, whenever the client uh, starts to communicate with a node that is not available, the driver will automatically be able to fail over another node. Uh, we've got, uh, we are able to discover all the nodes of the cluster. We support the brand new Castle tracing that has been introduced in Castle 1 and 2. 
uh, which is very useful whenever you want to debug uh, what's going on in your cluster. And we've got a bunch of policies to allow you to fine tune and to uh, make adapt it to, uh, to your actual uh, infrastructure. So because I'm, uh, I'm running out of time, I will just quickly iterate over a few examples of API just to give you an idea. Uh, and anyway, I will just give you the actual URL where you can uh, find this driver if you're interested. So uh, in this example, you see I just uh, connect to uh, an actual cluster. I just give in some seed uh, seed uh, node, you know, so to to let him uh, uh, connect to uh, to uh, to the Casanova cluster. Uh, several nodes, so, so that we uh, perform some high availability at bootstrap. At bootstrap. Uh, I connect to a given uh, key space. I've got a session object that is fully sweat safe, so I can inject it uh, anywhere in my application, and I will. Uh, and I just uh, send all my requests on that, on this object, and under the hood, all the connection pooling and uh, and asynchronous dispatching is uh, is performed transparently. Uh, then I can simply execute uh, my SQL statements. I think it's pretty straightforward. At which time I will be able to iterate over all my result sets. Uh, so if you're familiar with Cassandra, you can see that here we've got something much and actually way more simple. Uh, we are able to perform all that asynchronously without any sweat pool under the hood because everything relies on some asynchronous IOs. So I think that's pretty useful as well. Uh, and finally, uh, we plan to also introduce some object mapping, some very thin, very thin layer object mapping on top of that, uh, based on some annotation. Uh, so uh, I think you will really familiar to it. You can see that you can find the partition key concept that I've explained to you earlier. Uh, we will support inheritance as well. So if you're interested in this driver, uh, you can find it uh, on github uh, slash dastax slash java driver. Uh, feel free to contact me if you've got any question about it. Uh, if you've got any question, I'm not sure we've got any remaining time. Two minutes. So uh, if you've got some questions, that's time, yeah. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, that actually looks a bit like what's done on Spring Data. Uh, so the answer is uh, probably as uh, uh, we all try to make it simpler to, uh, to bring some high performance API for NoSQL. Uh, so uh, I know that Spring Data just uh, started to, uh, uh, to try to, in, uh, to integrate with Casanova because we had a bunch of uh, interface and, uh, and API change uh, recently. Uh, it actually made sense for them to hold a bit, uh, to wait a bit for to integrate with us, but uh, we definitely start to talk with them, uh, and uh, that's something you can expect probably So, And the same goes on the Ibernet world. I think there's this Ibernet OGM framework that is done by JBoss, and they all also uh, uh, they try to in integrate with a bunch of NoSQL and uh, Casanova is probably on the list as well. Is it possible for the next speaker to, to come up, please? Um, any more questions? Uh, my question is, uh, you see, foundationally, you have a column family consensus, and then now then you develop all the table and like a SQL format uh, kind of uh, structure. Uh, my question is, uh, are you going to support both? And uh, what uh, efficiency or con consider both? Uh, or what's, what's the difference? You know? um, so, yeah, uh, basically you, you're interested in support, uh, in having both schema-less and schema-full uh, environment that is uh, with SQL and, uh, and uh, all the uh, Swift current families. Uh, that's fully possible because uh, in CASM 1 and 2, you can, uh, you can add some uh, SQL suite table right besides your uh, 
classic cas on a design, so that's fully possible, and they can uh, both behave uh, perfectly together. Uh, and just to give you an idea, uh, keep in mind that all these SQL3 uh, data models that I've presented, just a small layer of abstraction on top of exactly the same storage engine. Uh, so uh, from a cast, pure cast on a standpoint, everything will actually just behave the same uh, from a storage engine standpoint. Uh, so the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, everything will work fine if you do so. So, but in the future, you support you kind of intention to move it to it. We we will just try to promote SQL3 in the future because we believe that's uh, a way simpler. Uh, interface and that make us more simpler and more accessible for more users. Uh, but we definitely don't want to pressure the current community with uh, with any kind of uh, of change and uh, any kind of uh, storage uh, of data models that you act to, uh, currently store using the uh, Swift API and the good old data model. Uh, we like to remain compatible with Cassandra for a bunch of versions, so you're totally safe with your investment. Uh, but besides that, we just try to move forward uh, and prepare for the future and hopefully make Cassandra simpler. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. thank you very much. Okay, so the usual fashion, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.